All right, it's now my privilege to bring to you Ryan Prashner and his paper reviewing the philosophical methods for arriving at truth and determining their effectiveness. Oftentimes, those who study philosophy become preoccupied with particular arguments or disagreements between schools of thought and thus become lost in the minutia. Taking a step back to fully understand a philosopher's method and to determine its effectiveness is beneficial for understanding the particular arguments a philosopher makes. A method serves as the foundation for a philosopher's subsequent proofs. Since a method is foundational, methods should be reviewed and examined carefully, for the foundation heavily influences one's train of thought. Before reviewing the methods used by renowned philosophers, the meaning of the phrase philosophical method must be understood, and the criteria must be set for how these methods will be judged. A method is given, it is defined as a systematic approach or procedure used in a given field to attain a certain object. The method of Plato, Aristotle, Descartes and Kant will be reviewed. The method used by each philosopher will be compared and reviewed to find if they are reasonable and effective at attaining their object, which is truth regarding reality. Each philosopher has a core concept, which is essentially the driving force that puts the method into operation. Without core concepts, there would be no method, since a method needs some reason to base its operation on. A core concept is a fundamental concept that animates a method, allowing for an operation to begin. Philosophical methods will be judged based on certain criteria. A core concept is clear, distinct, irreducible, begins with the elementary, and is, and is thorough. To review, a philosophic method is a, a systematic procedure used to reach coherent, logical ideas which are true. Core concept is a fundamental concept that animates a philosophical method. Philosophical methods will be judged based on certain criteria. Core concept is clear, distinct, irreducible, begins with the elementary, and is thorough. Plato's method is driven by the forms, which are ideals whose full nature often eludes humanity's mental reach due to human ignorance and various passions getting in the way of pursuing truth. Socrates' dialectic is driven by this principle, find your ignorance to move away from falsehood. Socrates helps people, give, helps people to give birth to their ideas, and then he tests these ideas to see if they are true or false. Quote, and the highest point of my art is the power to prove by every test whether the offspring of a young man's thought is a false phantom or instinct with life and truth." End quote. Socrates' dialogues end with unanswered questions and objection, objections against each other's definitions and arguments. A dialogue that leaves no solution and puzzles its readers is aporetic in nature. Aporetic dialogues expose one's ignorance but they often leave no clear solutions to the truths. Although an operatic dialogue's greatest strength lies in finding one's ignorance, which humbles those who pursue knowledge, Socrates discovered what made him wise by debating with a politician who insisted that he knew what he did not know. Socrates found he was wiser because he was able to admit his ignorance before plunging deeper into something he did not truly know. Quote, at any rate, it seems that I am wiser than he is to this small extent that I do not think that I know what I do not know, end quote. Definitions for forms such as knowledge or justice must endure a rigorous test to find whether or not the form is real. Socrates' core concept of pursuing forms often ends without solutions to what a virtue is. Socrates' pursuit of the form usually tells his readers more about what a virtue is or not, instead of showing what a virtue is. Plato's dialogues are excellent for humbling those who are overly confident 
that they know what they may not know. Ideas for virtue are found objectionable, absurd, or useful under specific situations, but not true universally after an examination. A result of pursuing ideal forms and failing as a result of pursuing ideal forms and failing to provide adequate ideas, Plato leaves his readers with the wisdom that it is very hard to truly know what a given virtue is. To know something is quite a big claim, which should not be made frequently. Aristotle's method was driven by his senses. He disagreed that knowledge gained by the senses was a mere imitation of the forms. He instead he encouraged using sight as a tool for truth. Quote, all men by nature desire to know. An indication of this is the, is the delight we take in our senses. For even apart from their usefulness, they are loved for themselves, and above all others, the sense of sight. For not only with a view to action, but even when we are not going to do anything, we prefer seeing, one might say, to everything else. The reason is that this, most of all, the senses, makes us know and brings to light many differences between things." End quote. It is important to note that Aristotle recognized reason's important role in assisting the senses. The senses brought in information about the external world into the mind for reason to consider. The senses act as a gateway to allow the mind to take in information, but the senses are limited in their capacity to aid human understanding. We do not regard any of the senses as wisdom, yet surely these give the most authoritative knowledge of particulars. But they do not tell us the why of anything. For example, why fire is hot, they only say that it is hot." End quote. Reason provides the why, whereas the senses feel heat and communicate this sensation to the mind. Aristotle tended to look at virtue differently depending on the situation, and if the virtue became harmful due to excess or deficiency. The mean or balance between excess and deficiency is the ideal course to take, and an action should only be performed in an appropriate context. Courage can become reckless, and good intentions can become disastrous from the lack of rational consideration. Aristotle's senses work in his ethics by considering specific actions which are good instead of focusing on an all-encompassing definition of a given virtue. By focusing on specific actions, Aristotle can help people act practically in real-life situations. By using his senses, Aristotle can break down the world into parts and understand how they fit into the greater whole. Aristotle can create detailed systems and show how they relate to each other and what their separate functions are. He can show the whole and its parts and create definitions and reduce objects to their essential parts. Aristotle's senses allow him to be specific in how he defines the world, his ethics, and what he sees around him. Now the effectiveness of each method will be found by following the four rules. These methods must be Clear, distinct, irreducible, begin with the elementary, and be thorough. The key difference between Plato's philosophy and Aristotle's can be reduced down to this. Plato reasons that knowledge must be of what is fixed. Plato disagrees that the world experience via the, sen the senses is more real not because reality is illusory. Instead, the world around us is like a painting, acting as a mere imitation, and less real than the forms. Plato's dialogues teach its readers intellectual humility by finding one's ignorance, but the dialectics suffer from the inability to build on themselves. Plato's idea of the forms makes them only accept an ideal definition of courage or justice. The standard for defining virtues is too high due to Plato's forms, for there can never be a perfect definition for a perfect form such as justice or temperance. One definition of a form will always miss an aspect of virtue because virtues as seen in others 
such as courage should depend on if virtue is used appropriately under different contexts. Aristotle looks at the particular instances and makes general guidelines to follow for directing reason towards moral actions. Aristotle can build an intellectual construction and create foundation, while Plato, unfortunately, often leaves the people he talks to perplexed. Meno is an example who describes Socrates as numbing him like a torpedo fish. Quote, for truly, both in soul and in mouse, I am numb and have nothing with which I can answer you. And yet thousands of times, I've made a great many speeches about virtue and before many people, and done very well, in my own opinion, anyway. Yet now, I'm altogether unable to say what it is." End quote. Aristotle's effectiveness in his method can be refined to him seeing the forms as inside the objects and not mere imitations. Aristotle states that the knowledge gained from Plato's view is not very helpful since the perfect form is not really in the particulars, quote. But again, they help in no wise either towards the knowledge of the other things, for they are not even the substance of these, else they would have been in them, or towards their being, if they are not in the particulars which share in them, end quote. Aristotle would look at a chair and state these objects are all chairs since they all share the same use a chair gives someone a place to sit. Aristotle can find what a chair is universally, define other particulars much more clearly, whereas making one real chair be over many chairs leaves more unanswerable questions than answers regarding a virtuous nature. A given object can be demystified and rendered more clear and distinct by applying Aristotle's senses to a particular item. Plato would aim at defining a virtue, never settling on the definition, and never building up his system far. Soon definitions for ideal forms fails because they are unable to build upon true ideas and make a system. Instead, the ideas proposed are almost always destroyed, ending in perplexity. Aristotle begins his philosophy simply by defining elementary proofs, but being clear and distinct and how he would identify something as simple as a chair. Also, Aristotle considers ethics as applying to real situations for actual people instead of an intellectual idea that might not even be practical or lead to proper moral decisions in the real world. Therefore, Aristotle reduces proper moral actions to simple guidelines and creates carefully constructed definitions through the senses. Aristotle's strengths lie in him being clear, distinct, and beginning at elementary proofs. Aristotle's senses help him see the particulars and specific details of reality, which help him become more clear and distinct with his ideas than Plato. Aristotle's senses were eventually questioned by Descartes, who doubted everything, including his senses, to find an indubitable and fundamental truth. An undoubtable truth would serve as a strong foundation that Descartes would use to metaphorically carry the world. Quote, Archimedes used to demand just one firm and immovable point in order to shift the entire earth. I too can hope for great things if I manage to find just one thing, however slight, that is certain and unshakable. End quote. Not even the senses were safe because Descartes could be in a dream or a deceiver could show him something which does not exist. In modern times, there are fake faces generated by computers, and even people trained to look for fake pictures often fail to detect artificial faces. Descartes discovered that the only truths he could know for certain, even if he were deceived by a powerful demon, is that he was being deceived and that his thoughts are being led astray through trickery. Quote, thinking, at last, I have discovered it, sought. This alone is inseparable from me. I am, I exist, that is certain, end quote. Descartes doubted not for its own sake, but to reach a goal, making his core concept goal-oriented skepticism. 
Goal-oriented skepticism helped him find a new foundation of knowledge residing in the mind. Descartes doubt, Descartes' doubt helped him find a fundamental truth. The mind, or I, exists and cannot be doubted, which would influence philosophy's trajectory by causing it to study the mind more. Doubts work very well for this particular context, but it should never be done without a clear goal or endpoint. Doubting one's worldview can help free people from bias or to strengthen one's positions by no longer strongmanning one's proponents by listening to others' doubts and questions. One can also attempt to understand another person's doubts instead of trying to win the argument by simply asking why they disagree with you instead of trying to debunk each claim. If someone provides a doubt, keep asking them to elaborate it until their doubts are made clear and distinct. This can help one understand others' arguments better and strengthen your own, or change your own. Your doubt and other people's doubts can help people better understand reality, leading to better and stronger ideas. Kant took a Copernican turn for Kant takes experience out of the center of how humans can know, puts the human mind in the center. No longer does the mind have to receive sense data as impressions stamped onto the wax tablet mind. Instead of taking a passive role, the mind actively structures the surrounding environment. The mind structures experience, for example, the necessity of causality is actively structured by the mind. Our minds are organized to understand reality through necessity. The mind sinks, the sun must rise because of the mind's internal programming to recognize patterns and categorize these patterns into rules for reality. The active mind has intuitions which are raw sense data the mind later affects with understanding and reason. The human mind has already altered the environment by understanding its influence. Raw, dumb senses are hard to imagine because they require the mind to stop categorizing and cease thinking. The active mind with intuitions, understanding, works on reality by instantly instilling a metaphorical colored tint to raw sense data. The mind's characteristic operations of intuition and understanding necessarily continue the same way tomorrow and the next day for the mind will still necessarily experience reality through its color print. Since the active mind never changes its basic operations, then reality necessarily and universally bear the features of subject and predicate along with necessary universal truths because that is how the mind consistently continues to operate. While Kant gives philosophy a way to claim universal and necessary truths through the active mind working on sensory data, Kant also takes away the Aristotelian notion of perceiving objects in themselves. Quote, For we have nothing to do with other objects than those which belong to possible experience because objects which cannot be given us in any experience are nothing for us." End quote. An objective world beyond the way we categorize reality cannot be reached for the human mind is a fish in water immersed in its subjective experience. Kant takes a detailed approach to study to the study of how the mind understands and critically looks at separate faculties of the mind, including reason, the senses, and more. Quote, reason has the sources of its knowledge in itself, not in objects and their observation, by which its stock of knowledge could be further increased. End quote. Kant showed how necessary and universal proofs could exist his Copernican turn showed how people's rose-tinted glasses affect their perception of reality and made philosophy turn towards the mind to begin investigation into the conditions under which thinking occurs. Before Kant, 
Floss, we can actually put the cart out before the horse. The horse is the mind. The cart being the big questions of philosophy. The mind is the tool everyone uses to solve the world's biggest questions. But every good craftsman should know how their tools work. Kant shows how the mind works on reality and shows the strengths and weaknesses of the mind. A welder should know how to use their tools so they don't break them by using them wrong. Knowledge of the mind helps people use their mental tools to achieve results and to avoid using their tools in situations that the mind cannot know, such as trying to grasp what objects are in themselves. Descartes' doubt led him to an indubitable foundation, but Descartes failed to clearly define the end of doubt. Kant's study of the mind made him search for what the mind can know and put limits to what reason cannot know. Descartes established the mind as the source of knowledge rather than the senses, creating a shift in philosophy. Although Descartes' construct constructive skepticism is effective at finding an indubitable foundation, his doubting becomes unrestrained and without a clear end point. Certainty cannot be reached by doubting everything without a limit. Descartes offers no clearly defined limit, meaning no one will know where, when to cease doubting everything to its core. Quote, I shall do this until the weight of preconceived opinion is counterbalanced and the distorting influence of habit no longer prevents my judgment from perceiving things correctly, end quote. Descartes states a beginning and an end point, but only vaguely states what this end point is, making his method fail to be clear and distinct. Also, doubting may reject ideas without considering the new ones. For example, Aristotle still used a few of Plato's ideas from the forms while removing others. It would not be helpful for Aristotle to extinguish the forms completely because he found reason to doubt the forms' eternal nature. Kant's philosophy helps in understanding the fundamentals, that is, the metaphysical conditions for thinking, types of knowledge, and limits what the mind can know. Kant's limit on knowledge helps the mind focus on the simple fundamentals such as the types of knowledge rather than becoming too ambitious by skipping the fundamentals and tackling the big questions. Without proper grounding or understanding of what can be known. By mastering the fundamentals and studying what can be known, humanity can begin pursuing truths more effectively. Quote, the question here, therefore, is not so much how this performance is possible as to how to set its goal and induce men of clear heads to quit their hitherto perverted and fruitless cultivation for one that will not deceive, and how such a union for the common end may be best directed, end quote. Descartes turns philosophy towards studying the mind, but fails to clearly to clarify the limits or dangers of doubt. Descartes' method should have gone into detail on the mind as the foundation of knowledge. Kant progressed Descartes' foundation further with an in-depth study of how the mind affects the way humans perceive reality. Plato's method was driven by the forms, which had its strengths, but unfortunately, the dialogues did not progress far in reaching a virtue's true nature. A great many pages could have been added to the dialogues regarding system to guide philosophy or a way for philosophy to build upon itself and arise from the fog of uncertainty. Plato did offer the forms which Aristotle later modified, and Plato taught intellectual humility and encouraged one to find their ignorance through his dialectic. Aristotle provided the first rigorous system based on the senses, making philosophy a practical science that could be guided towards true ideas, build upon itself, and establish elementary concepts. Descartes took the senses' trusted position away by doubting them and sought to find a better foundation for knowledge. 
Aristotle trusted his senses too much, which can be easily fooled, failing to critically analyze the mind and give the mind a proper place as the guide towards discovering reality. Descartes used constructive skepticism to find his foundation and establish the mind as the source of knowledge. Descartes failed to further define and examine his foundation and also failed to define the end point of his doubt. Kant wanted to examine the mind and ask questions that would reveal different functions of the mind. Whilst we develop ideas that are more clear and more distinct as time goes on, for example, Kant's analysis of the mind is clearer than Aristotle's understanding of the soul, which only has four parts. The core concept should not be completely abandoned because there are weaknesses in it. Various philosophical methods lead to good ideas, but the weaknesses in ideas are approved upon by others. Quote, if we start from a well-founded but undeveloped thought, which another has bequeathed to us, we may well hope by continued reflection to advance further than the acute man to whom we owe the first spark of light. End quote. There is a lot to learn from ancient philosophers' methods. For example, Plato's dialectic teaches its readers to vigorously test ideas to find one's ignorance. Quote, not with any impatience, but genuinely examining ourselves to see what we can make of these apparitions that present themselves to our minds. End quote. Plato encourages people to find and admit their ignorance to avoid falling into error. To claim one knows is a bold statement, but people often say they know, but they do not know. Therefore, claims of knowledge regarding a virtue's nature is a big statement to make. Aristotle's senses, aided by reason, improve philosophy by studying individual instances of virtue under different contexts and labeling different parts of the soul, which ultimately leads to ideas that are more clear and distinct than his predecessor, Plato. Using the senses and reason can lead to very clear and distinct ideas. The more clear and distinct an idea is, the better one can understand and distinguish different ideas. Descartes assigned the mind as the foundation of knowledge by questioning everything to find certainty. Also, learning and understanding others' doubts and questions can help strengthen your arguments or lead to uncovering false ideas. Kant shows his readers how their internal mental tools function and work on reality. Knowing how mental tools work is efficient because then one can know how to use understanding, reason, and the senses by first understanding how these mental faculties function. Thank you very much, Mr. Pratchner. Um, I would like to begin by looking at the concept of doubt that you mentioned is used by Descartes in coming to knowledge. Um, you say that Descartes has difficulty um, knowing the extent to which doubt should be used. Um, my question would be whether or not doubt is even appropriate in the acquisition of knowledge. Um, is doubt actually effective in guiding one towards knowledge, or is doubt simply an acid that always will dissolve any knowledge that it touches? I think that doubt um, has its biggest flaw when it doesn't have any type of endpoint to it. As I talked about in the paper, it has to be going, be going to some point, because if it's not, then it could just go unrestrained and not really get to any goal. But um, I find doubt to be a good type of um, skill that he, I mean, obviously Socrates is using it, thinking, you know, do I really know what I think I know? And then the politicians and the, he was talking to was thinking, oh, I know what I know. <laughs> you know, and he didn't actually know because he was overly confident in what he was saying and then look at what he was saying. So if you are able to, um, question your own ideas or let them be questioned by others, then sometimes you can develop them more um, or find out that, oh, there might be something wrong with them, etc. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> you seem to want some doubt, but you don't want too much doubt. 
can you give us an idea of how one would determine just exactly where this proper amount of doubt is in the Goldilocks solution? Well, um, doubt leads to, as you know, Descartes wrote in his um, writings, to find this indubitable foundation and so forth. And then he specifically states, you know, this isn't for everybody to do. This is what I am doing in this case. But I definitely think that if you're going to doubt in an extreme way, then you should probably um, have an end point. And if you're just doubting in a sense that you're um, saying, oh, I don't really know if I really understand this correctly. Like, and maybe that is basically, I don't really think I understand what Plato means by the forms, you know, or I'm what I might be my, what I might be saying is wrong about about this. I want to learn more. There's and then it's like there's like the kind of like little that of doubt, and then you can just improve your ideas type of thing. Or there's like the bigger type of doubt, which is you know why do people think this way? You know, I don't understand why people think this way. And then you talk to other people and you ask them to s explain why you doubt, you know, certain position, etc. You know, and then they, they give you their um, doubts about it, and then you can just look at what they're saying and say, hmm, okay, this is what you believe, and this is why, and this is how your, the reasoning works. So it can even work to, as I tell you in my paper, to understand what other people are saying to see, um, to then look at your own knowledge again in a Socratic type way and say, what am I um, what, you know, am I right, am I, am I wrong, you know, and you kind of do this, like, Socratic type reflection type thing, or you can, I don't really think people do it nowadays, but they just have a philosophic discussion, but you can do that as well, like, with Socrates and do the dialogue and have it say, well, what is truth, what is this, and go over what this, well, this person said this, so you can do that as well, and talk about their ideas in that context. Yeah, you also discussed um, Socrates, and um, but you, you say uh, Plato's method was driven driven by the forms, which had its strengths, but unfortunately the dialogues did not progress far in reaching a virtue's true nature. And you, you're referring to the operatic dialogues, where they really don't come to a definite conclusion. And yet in the Socratic system, wisdom was knowing what you do not know. And so in those operatic dialogues, is it not unfortunately, but fortunately, they don't come to an end because there was not a definite answer to be had. Why would you say unfortunately there, rather than saying in the Socratic system, when you don't know, you don't come to an answer? Isn't that actually truth finding to, to be able to come to the point where you can say, I do not know? Well, um, in, a, in a sense of, you know, in the Socratic type um, days and those type of days where um, people thought about virtue and as uh, this type of ideal and the type of sense where you reach for the um, forms. I mean, not to say that it's wrong or anything, but um, it's um, a limiting type of science because you can't um, develop like specific type. You, know, you don't have to always be right about everything, essentially, is what I'm trying to get at is if you if you just want to do as er, you know Aristotle did later on, look at specific situations and um, contexts, people. Okay, very good. And I'm going to open up other questions right now, and I'm also going to make sure that the porta potty is put in the right place. I will be right back. Go ahead, and I'm sure Anna can have a question for you. Okay. <laughs> you to elaborate on what did you mean by Aristotle trusting in his senses too much? Okay, so for example, he would look at, you know, an, a chair or an, or an object and think, this is um, real, you know, this is part of reality and so forth, and uh, I have no reason to doubt this, you know, and then um, later on, we come to realize, and especially in the modern day, this technology that 
what we see, you know, in a visual screen, for instance, is obviously not real. It's just mm -hmm. like little pixels, little things. So um, if somebody's um, making a big emphasis, like Aristotle was, that the senses are, you know, integral for understanding what we see around us and so forth, you know, we can, we can, we can make differences between um, what, what objects are by just looking at them and reasoning and so forth. It's um, a it's a way of approaching philosophy, but it it gets improved upon, in my opinion, by Descartes. Is that he's able to look at the mind and realize that well, we can be fooled at what we're looking at and what really what's going on while we're categorizing reality and all that is within our minds. Mm -hmm. So, all right, very interesting paper. Again, like I said, I love the overview of all these different ways of coming to knowledge. My question is that, it's kind of jumping off Anna's question. You said that you preferred Descartes' method in this case because it questions more what the senses take in. And from what I can remember, Plato was a lot more skeptical of, of the senses than Aristotle was. Yet still there's this big shift with Descartes between saying that the foundation of what I know to be reality is something outside of me, toward I find the foundation of reality within myself. So would you say that shift is a good thing or in a way an improvement of coming to knowledge? Or like what, what would you say about that sort of shift? Okay, well, you know what, well, I don't want to get too far into any weird things, but um, when I first sort of read Descartes and I heard him saying, oh, the foundation of all I know is sort of like in my mind, this is a sort of way of taking it too far. So it's like a type of idea of solipism, which is like the whole world is in my mind type of thing. It kind of sounds like if you were to think that way, you'd be a crazy person, <laughs> you know? Everything is like all of you people would then be, you know, just figments of my imagination or something. I don't really know exactly how that would work. But I think what Descartes means more when he says the mind is like a lot happens within our mind um, with everything. So it's like this piece of paper. I'm labeling it a color. I'm giving it all of these um, letters, meaning behind letters, etc. They're all happening in the mind. And I'm not just looking at it as this like raw, just like sense it's not thinking of it. And it kind of connects more to Kant as it gets later on, and the Kant will upset more or less. It isn't just, you know, raw senses, and then it's all kinds of like the active mind is saying what's uh, giving a bunch of meaning to what's going on here and all that. But uh, I don't know if I explained that. Well. <laughs> so if I understand what you're saying, um, it's more the human interpretation of sensory experiences than either the experiences or just the mind itself? Well, yeah, I mean, there's like the real, I kind of like it, think what Kant says is pretty interesting about like the real world, how we see it, that way we don't actually see it. So that's, so we see um, this piece of paper, you know, and we can only see like certain Think certain frequencies of light and so forth. So what's actually there, and the frequencies of color and all that, science. <laughs> so we see something which is a little bit different from what's actually there. So that's sort of what I mean by um, the mind um, giving something, you know, a meaning or a word or so forth. And then it's the like senses which work on it differently than what's actually there. Um, I guess I just would like you to define endpoint a little bit more. Um, the way that I was understanding this, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, is kind of doubting with a line in the sand of like, oh, I'm only going to doubt this, this topic or this topic. Is that kind of what you're um, intending? It's sort of like, um, and you know the way I think Descartes put it was his... Archimedes, you know, he's holding the whole world. It's this type of point that he wants to reach, which is, I can't doubt anything else after I, no, not, not exactly like that, but once I reach this point, you know, 
this is an undoubtable truth, and then I can start my philosophy from here. So that's sort of the end point that, Eric, that um, Descartes states. I'm going to find this indubitable foundation. And after that point, he still starts doubting other things, and he doesn't really like expand upon, well, what is the mind as the source of the foundation of knowledge? He kind of goes off to other things after that. But the end point is, is his indubitable, indubitable truths is what I would find that as. OK. Um, but when you're, if you're doubting with an end point, um, would that not leave rise for um, confirmation bias? Of you, you kind of go into it with a mindset, and you don't actually allow the doubt to do the work of um, opening up your eyes, if you will. Or you, oh, you can keep. No, go questions. ahead. <laughs> oh, I mean that is an interesting question because if you think about it, I mean Descartes could have thought, well, maybe there are multiple foundations. Maybe there's not just one foundation of. You know, I don't really know how that would work, but there would be like multiple different things which he could believe, not just one thing that's indubitably true. He seemed to have it set in his, into his mind that there was like this one point, this one point he would move philosophy forward with. So, I guess it could be just a bias, I suppose. Thank you. At the, uh, I liked your paper, by the way. <laughs> Um, at the beginning of your fourth paragraph, uh, you named the method that you'd be using in the paper to determine whether um, a philosophical idea or concept or you know system is effective at arriving at truth. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on why you chose the criteria that you did. And if you followed all of those criteria, do you think that necessarily means that you got to truth? Or do you think you could follow all of those criteria and still arrive at the wrong conclusion? Well, I definitely think I could still arrive at the wrong conclusion because, you know, we're all... I mean, I just don't like saying, oh, I know what this is, you know, confidently, in the sense that I... I mean, I, I know, I know, you know, I could definitely be wrong. <laughs> and I haven't really... Took him like 20 years of him to think about all these things and etc. Well, let me get to the main point here. So, I'm talking about um, the clear, show. distinct, uh, right. irreducible, and uh, elementary and thorough. So, if it's, a, if it's a clear idea, then it's um, something which is not obscure, it's, it's something which is. Um, just say it's something which is clear. It's not too vague, and that kind of connects closely with how an idea is distinct. You can differentiate it between some two different ideas, and you know this is the idea, and it's not this one. So it's just refining an idea down until it's something which is um, um, unique in the sense it has a certain type of uniqueness to it, and then that's not really enough because then you have to. <clears throat> refine it down, and then if the irreducible part comes in, where you have to um, get to the main point of um, the of the idea of, um, for example, let's think, uh, you know, Aristotle or you know, Descartes, for instance, he once got down to the foundation of what his doubts led him to, like the end point, and that was where he put progressed further. But he wanted to get specific about. Is you know where he's going to go. He's going to go to this end point. Um, and then Kant uh, was a pretty good example of, of how he was able to um, create different definitions, like you know, get right down to what they meant, distinct definitions, and get down to um, reduce them down to very um, small, understandable points. You know, phenomena, the noumena, all these different weird things, <laughs> and. Um, and then the elementary proofs, I would go to, you know, also like um, Aristotle defined the four causes and all the different, um, on the, and the, the simple rules of logic, law non contradiction, it goes over these type of things. And I like how, you know, Descartes goes over what can really, you know, be, be known. I don't know what I actually know, so I'm gonna go and doubt. Till I reach this type of endpoint, 
So it's that type of like looking at, if, getting with elementary things, not getting too far into these type of big questions like what's the meaning of life or what is all of this, um, is it real or not? Oh, yeah, I guess if it's real or not, it will be a big card. For that. And in the thorough part of this, to make sure not to leave anything out, um, because there might be something um, that is important if you just leave something out, I suppose. <laughs> So that all those work together, I think those are why it's pretty important to um, uh, you use them because it makes an idea. I, I just happen to think, I suppose it makes an idea make more sense, I suppose. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Descartes, um, I think, therefore I am. Without sensory perception, <laughs> what would you think about? Without <laughs> sensory perception. Without, without if you're a blind person, I suppose. Blind, you can hear all our perceptions, nothing. I really don't know. What would, what would you be able to base a thought on? Um, so you couldn't even feel anything. That's no. perception. That's, right. that's senses. No, no senses at, at all. I don't really know. It, I mean, it seems like a interesting Star Trek episode idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what Aristotle is saying? We, we see, even if it's like green, the color green, it's really not green. It's, you know, the spectrum. Are you mean Descartes? No. Or Aristotle. Aristotle's, we learn by our senses, right, our senses, right? Oh yeah, then if you take those all away. Take all that away, right. because Descartes saying it's all in my mind. Right. But what does his mind have to his process mind. if there's no senses? senses. <laughs> I mean, I'm a human, I'm living with senses and with all these things, and if I got them all taken away, I suppose I might as well be dead, I don't know. <laughs> I'll ask my shortest question. Are reality and God different? Because sometimes I will look on the internet or I'll see videos and other resources, where, for instance, some people will define God as ultimate reality, or some people will just be talking about reality, and their speech end up sound ends up sounding like God or something like that. So I'm just kind of curious, since you used the word reality throughout this paper, and since uh, this is about how we do epistemology, what do you think? Are reality and God the same or different? So it's it's a tough of um, you know. Kind of goes down to maybe Spinoza a little bit, you know, panseistic, you know, pan yeah, panseism, there you go, not panseism. Or, but, you know, I don't even know, I'm willing to admit that I don't even really completely think I understand Spinoza because he says, like, pan actually. I don't really even know what that means yet. I'm, I looked at, like, different definitions of pan -inseism. this is pan -seism. That's really weird. So I don't really... And then I, you know, looked at, you know, you know, what, what everyone else doesn't really seem to. I don't really remember a whole lot about Anselm and all the other people talking about why God can't be this or that. It seems to me, sort of as a first impression type look at it, or haven't thought about it that much, but it seems to me that if God um, was a part of nature in some way, it would kind of make sense because he's omnipresent, you know? So that part would make sense. I don't really know how that works, though. If he's inside things, this is a sort of there in his, like, if he's inside, you know, this piece of paper, I don't really know. But um, if I were to, if I, this is how I would find out, though. I, I really like how Anselm, you know, he talks about that which then nothing greater can be conceived. Mm -hmm. If God is better, if he is um, in the like panseistically, you know, whatever, oh, like, panseism, right? Yeah. yeah. If he's better in that way, I suppose, because God has to be all good. God has to be the best, you know, all good. He can't be deficient. So I suppose that kind of makes sense. Also, what the Bible would say about God, if you could find clearly make an argument that it says that in the Bible along with him being the best version of God or the greatest 
in that sense. And it's based for like biblically based on something, and also, you know, it makes God better in some way. He's lacks something if he's not in the reality. That's kind of how I would approach it, I suppose. Hmm. Oh, you got a question? Um, yeah, so going off of Blessing's question, not even like God is in sort of the created order, but would you say that there is a difference between God and like what is true? And what is real in the sense of like not even what is like just physically there, but to know that something is real and to know that it exists and to know that truth exists. Would that be sort of a separate a separate concept from God or would they be related in some case? Okay, so I would probably go along with um, I think it was also Angelo who sort of Solved the um, the question. Oh, I forgot what the dialogue was called, but it was a dialogue where um, Plato was talking to some other people about if God uh, does just things because they're you know just I think or if he's um, or if you know oh, I don't like quite remember yeah you were certain yeah no. so I would I would like break the question and sort of say that, you know, God is truth, you know, he is that thing. And it's and then we do that because then, you know, it makes him greater than just participating in the truths, you know. It would make God greater that, that way. So that's why I would think that he is truth and that he's not just um, the truth is like some separate entity from God. Okay, so you say like the truth is in accordance with his nature? Yeah, I think in his nature. What and then you know that kind of goes as another question like God's fundamental nature. Like what what is that? You know. But you can keep going. <laughs> but anyone else have any questions? No? What's the one sentence thesis of your paper? By the way, it was really good. Um, I never heard somebody say the word indubitably. <laughs> it's a one word to say. <laughs> But of the one sort of the takeaway, main you know, like takeaway. a one sentence thesis. So uh, one we, sentence. we look at a lot of different philosophers. You criticize some, you praise others. But what's your like thesis of the paper? So yes, the paper um, begins at just looking at where a philosopher is going to to uh, start out their ideas. So it's um, and it affects everything else they do. So Aristotle, his senses was a huge deal for him. And with Plato, his forms were the way he seed, he already saw like these ideals and they're out there and we have to reach them, you know? It's sort of like this fundamental type of idea that affects the way they reach their other conclusions later on, if that makes any sense. Thank you very much, Mr. Brassner. Okay.